you know, look, th this was a pretty simple bet that we made yesterday. As I said, you see how the other indexes were taking off? I have an image of that from the thing. So let's take, let's see if we can find it. Uh, that needs to be refreshed. <laughs> oh, and of course, if it refreshes, I lose my sign in. So many things happening at the same time. Ah, 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 there you go. That's what I kept doing wrong. All right, so now we can go back to Phil Stock World, hopefully. And hopefully we'll get the right screen on Thinkorswim. Traders executed on or something will now settle. Yeah, 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 whatever. Don't care. Shorts. Nope, don't want that. I want setup for the webinar. Say okay to that. There we go. Okay, so here's what happened. Oh, by the way, so we have a, a new section now. So for the premium traders, there's going to be every week I'm going to make a post for the premium traders and we'll just keep track of those trades over there doing the day trading, swing trading type of stuff, plus some long-term trades, just whatever. So if you're into that kind of thing, we can make a little bit of, hopefully make a bit of money doing that. I'll talk about that more in a minute. So yesterday, oh, here you go, good. Can't make it bigger though. So yesterday, this was the setup yesterday in the chat room and oh, here, okay. So in the chat room yesterday, this is what I was looking at. So everybody was taking off, um, is this today? Oh, this was as of this morning. It still hadn't taken off. So as of yesterday's close, though, everybody had been taking off and hitting, going back to their highs, except the Russell, which was really beaten down. It was down 50 points, which is um, oh, 10 points would be 5%. So about two, it's down about 2.5%. Now, according to the 5% rule, we're going to get a bounce off a 2.5% drop. So we expected a bounce of some sort anyway. Plus the other indexes were moving up. So we figured the, the Russell had a good chance of catching up. And <clears throat> that's all you're going to look for in a, in a uh, day trade is you just want to find something. And day trade means short term, doesn't mean only that day. Um, it means you want to find something where there's a small chance of losing. There's a, so you have to find a line in the sand that you can draw. So we said, okay, as long as we're holding 20-40, on the Russell here, and as long as the S&P is over 5,300, that's our second safety line, right? Because the S&P failing 5,300 would indicate some pretty, some, some serious change of weakness. I'm sorry, this was back when it was over here, just over the 5,300 line. So in fact, here's what I said. What I actually said, verbatim as they say. So I said, Everyone is recovering but the rut, still down 1%. So IWM July 210 calls. So I'm going and taking a short-term call. They were 235 at the time, or a fun way to play as long as IWM now 202.42 holds 202. And it did go a teeny bit below, but not for any significant amount of time. Delta is 31, and we made an audible call on that too. And I said, look, I think we should hold it overnight. I don't see any reason why the setup isn't valid. Um, and I said the delta is 31, so we're going to risk 80 cents. Um, 
but the 202 is a 585. So it's a double if we get back to 210. That's what I was looking at. So in, so in other words, you know, we, we were at 202 and if it went up, we should get almost a double for it going up. And, and, and by the way, I get the way I do that, it's nothing complicated about that. I just go to IWM. People are like, oh, you got to do the Greeks and all this and the Delta and the Theta and the Delta. No, you don't. You just, <laughs> you just go to July. Uh, more strikes, more strikes. Okay. So you just go to July and I look at the two tens and I say, great. So if the Russell goes back up $10, then the two tens should become the price of the two hundreds. See how easy that is? All you got to do is think about the move you're going to see, and then this strike will become that strike. You know, more or less, not exactly, but that gives you an idea of where it's going to be. And I think I was looking at only the 202s, which are $8, because so I was saying if we move up to 210. But the point is, that's how you can determine how much you're going to make on a certain move. I'm going to make uh, 40 cents on this, 40 cents here, 80 cents on a $2 move, a dollar twenty on a, a dollar twenty-five on a, a three dollar move, and that also helps you decide on the position, which position is going to give me the most bang for the buck on a quick move. That's all. So now the two tens are three o two, and we started at uh, I forget now. <laughs> now I forgot. We started at uh, two thirty five. So so you know it's sixty five cents. So 65 divided by 235, that it's nothing because I didn't have the number lock on. 65 divided by 235, 27%. That's good money. <laughs> and that's all it takes. You know, that's 27% in 24 hours. So we're just doing this for you know, the swing trading, I want to keep with the premium members right now because I don't want too many people doing it. And I don't want people who don't have good discipline, number one, because you can't have everybody crowding to these trades at once. And the other important fact, I don't want people chasing either. That's critical. And the other important thing is you have to be able to afford to lose the money because you could lose it as fast as you can gain it doing this kind of stuff. So that's a swing trade. That's what we call a swing trade. But I'm a, I'm a fundamentalist, so keep that in mind. So in other words, when I'm looking for a trade setup, I still want to find the fundamentals. I don't just play because something hit a line. It has to hit a line and have a reason for you know it going that way. In fact, when we looked at the end of the day, when I said I want to stick with it, uh, not, but not BA. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I picked July because I said, well, in case we're wrong, we have time to recover. And um, and I said, we're finishing at 221, but it's a very different bet if we keep it overnight. There, That's only something you should do with craps money, the amount of money you're willing to lose on a roll of the dice at the table, as it could go either way. I just said that. So I said, we had a strong finish with the indexes. They all finish at the highs. That meant the Asian and European indexes would be playing catch up when they opened. And the, and the PMI, which I was worried would be bad, wasn't going to come until 9.45. It turned out to be good. And uh, the, so there's no reason to worry overnight, which means I'm inclined to keep the trade. Those are the fundamentals. Those are the macro headwinds that you look at to decide whether it's a good time or not to stay in the trade. And that's why we review these calendars. That's why we're always aware of what's coming up, including what Fed speaker is coming up, what's he gonna, what's he likely to say, what kind of is he hawkish, dovish, so on and so forth. And then, and then what are the upcoming data points that we're gonna hear from? And you know, the, we look at all these different factors before we before we determine what we're gonna trade. But anyway, so. In the end, uh, it, we, we've been borne out. Look what happened. So now everything blasted higher. And by the way, as an alternate, I said, you can also just play the Russell and these pay um, 50 bucks a point. So that, 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 that's a thousand dollar move in the Russell uh, futures. <laughs> so that's, a, that's a nice way to make money too.
And we just started this portfolio today with $110,000 and we're up $400 on that one. The only trade we have going is Intel at the moment. So Intel is, um, oh, we're trying to buy the 25 calls for six for, for uh, that's not working so far. We're trying to buy, sell the October 30 calls because I bought them by accident. Um, for 350 and they're at 330 so we're not selling those yet and we already did sell the puts that's the only trade we have on at the moment here we didn't get the rest of last night because I hadn't gotten this portfolio funded yet but that's good so we'll be able to follow this one along and make sure every you know if we're going to do this kind of trading we need to make sure every single thing fills and fills properly so we know where we stand on everything so I'm running it against a live portfolio to make sure everything's fillable um, and we're going to see how we do. But honestly, you know, you make $400, $500 a day on a $100,000 portfolio. And what are you going to make? There's 200 trading days in a year. If you can make $500 every year, you're going to make $100,000. You're going to double your money. That's all you have to do. And, and again, this is why I'm, I'm, very much of an, I'm very much of an advocate of not swinging for the fences on trades. It's like, all you have to do is make a little bit of money every day, don't lose money, and it'll accumulate very quickly. You don't have to be in such a hurry to make these big trades. And, and, it, and if, your goal is more, if your goal is that, you can, is that making $100,000 on $100,000, doubling your money in, in a year is not enough, you shouldn't be trading. You should really be hitting the craps tables or something like that because honestly, it's you know you don't have much chance of, of doubling your money trading unless you're really spot on all the time. It's not normal to double your money, and and trying to double your money means you're make, taking tremendous risks, and you have just as good of a chance of losing all your money. And that's the problem. You don't want to get into those kind of situations, so you need to. You know, I, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to show how to trade aggressively but conservatively at the same time. That's what I'm trying to teach our premium members in this portfolio. All right, so speaking of which, that was the Intel play. We had the Hewlett Packard play yesterday, also didn't make the portfolio officially, but that came out very well. And the Hewlett Packard play was, I think I reprinted it here. It's just a bull call spread because we put it in our $700 a month portfolio, but this this doesn't show that the uh, change. But ahead of earnings, we took the, this is where we were when we made the play. And it, it's a, one of those triangle squeezy things. And so I said, I think this is gonna resolve up because I don't see why it would resolve down when all, all the numbers for Hewlett Packard indicate that they should be worth more money. I don't know how into that I got. I think I did. I think I got into that in the seven hundred dollar portfolio. Let's see what I said. To do. The fabulous portfolio. Um, no, I didn't get too into it, but. I said, um, <laughs> um, this has the $3,900, 185% potential. It's just a bull call spread. There's no margin required or anything else. So it's just floating along here and we had earnings. And I said, you know, I said, uh, we expect to have good earnings if they, uh, this evening. And if not, we're going to, you know, we have 18 months for this blue chip stock to recover. <clears throat> Uh, so again, fairly low risk with a high potential reward. If it doesn't work out, we're probably going to get a chance to stop out into some support here or here. And if it does work out, then we're on our way to 185% gain. We only need to get to 20 over the next 18 months. That's not very ambitious. All right. So lo and behold, uh, we have the earnings today. And they popped right up to 20. All right, so that, there's that one day move. It's up 12%, uh, 13% so far today. And that's fine, because now all we have to do is hold it. But already, uh, the spread, wow, what was the spread? I forgot. Um, <laughs> Uh, 
So here's the 1520 spread for $2,100. Okay, 1520 of 2026, 10 of each. And so if we go to 2026, <clears throat> and we're not going to probably get a big move because um, they're so far so far out in time. But still, this is not HP. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like those numbers are all wrong. HPE. So now the 15s are 630. 630 minus how much are the 20s? 365. Or 2650. And what were they yesterday? They were 2100. Yeah, they were 2100 yesterday. So they made $550. Five, so 550 divided by 2100. Is again 26 percent that's our magic number today so that made 21 percent 26 percent in one day now we plan to make 185 percent so there's still plenty to go and now it looks a lot safer than it did in fact now it's actually still a great trade right because uh what i say is 26.50 and it's a five thousand dollar spread so it's still going to make 23.50 and 23.50 divided by 26.50 Still going to make 88% more from where it is now in the next 18 months. And now it doesn't even seem dangerous because the thing's already at 20. This spread is in the money and you're still going to make 88% over 18 months. That's how you trade. This That's a good return. It's not as good as it was yesterday, but it's still a good return. There's lots and lots of ways to make money. That's the point of this thing. There's so many different ways to make money. And let's take a look at the entire $700 portfolio and talk about that. So the $700 a month portfolio, the idea, and this is not it. <laughs> We're talking about it, but this isn't it. Um, it was yesterday. So how to become a millionaire. There we go. And all the members can see this portfolio. So how to become a millionaire part. Now, we've been doing this for 22 months, which was since, I don't know when, um, August 25th of 2022. And so far, we have a profit of 72%, which is very nice. That means we're basically on it. We got two more months to the year, so 10% more. Figure we're going to hit 80, figure we'll hit just about 80% uh, return, so 40% per year return. That is absolutely all we need to get on this track. Seven seven hundred a month is eighty four hundred added a year. So we're putting in eighty four hundred a year for eleven years. So in the end, well, that's a big difference too. We're only going to put in eighty four hundred times eleven. Ninety two thousand dollars. So it's only going to cost us ninety two thousand dollars at forty percent. Not that we're going to keep that up, but at this pace, we're only putting in ninety two thousand dollars, and we're going to end up with one point two million dollars at the end of 11 years that's at a 40 percent rate that's why a 40 percent rate is ridiculous nobody makes money like that that's insane you're averaging a hundred percent gain every single year <laughs> basically that's pretty damn good um uh, that's what 40 percent is and that's again that's why i keep saying if you're you know if you're not happy doubling your money in a year you're just gambling because that's an insane amount of money warren buffett makes 16 percent a year and he's a multi-billionaire. So what are you going to be, a trillionaire? <laughs> Someone's going to just hand you a trillion dollars because you trade because you double your money every year? It doesn't work like that. There's not that kind of money doesn't work that way. 
you know, anybody can get struck by lightning, but, but, you know, it's not the way the market works. You're not going to every single time be successful and get those kind of returns. Um, the premises portfolio is we put in $700 every month and we let, um, and then we try to make a 20, we're trying to make a 20% return. Our goal is to make no less than 10%. That's that we, you know, blow past that. But, you know, we make a 20% return, we're going to be in great shape. Even at 10%, though, that's our minimum. You'll still, in 30, in, in 36 months, you will still have a million dollars doing it that way. You'll put in about $250,000 and you'll have a million in your portfolio in 36 months, even just making 10%. So, you know, so making money, becoming a millionaire, I know 30 years is a long time, but it, it depends when you start. You know, if, if you miss the bus or if you, uh, you know, if you don't have, if you don't think you have 30 years left, think about your grandchildren, getting them started now. You know, you got, you got a 10 year old grandson by the time, if you just follow this pattern for him and teach him how to follow, how to keep it going, he will have a million dollars and it will be adjusted for inflation because if, if the market goes up, the returns will be better, so on and so forth. He'll have a million dollars when he's 40 and wants to buy a home for his kids. I mean, isn't, isn't that what you want, right? Isn't that what the whole point of investing is for is to, is to provide for yourself and your family down the road? And this is a great discipline to teach the kids, to, to teach them about saving, and consistently putting money away. And again, if they're 40 and they've got a million dollars and they go for another 40 years, the, it, here you go. <laughs> uh, well, okay. So if it's, even if they're, even if they're only, oh, I can't change it. Silly me. Um, here's a calculator. You guys have seen me play with this. So we start with 700, we put in 8,400 a year. We do that for 40 years at 10%. No, I'm sorry, not 40 years, 60 years. So when they're ready to retire, when your 10-year-old grandchild is ready to retire, $28 million. And all you have to do is get them started. Your, your, your family in the future will never have to work again if you just now Put aside $8,400 a year for each of the grandchildren and put it into an account that generates 10% returns. And that's what I'm teaching you how to do. That's the point of this portfolio. So this is how you do that. And every month, we, we track this every single month, month one, two, three, 21, all the way through so far. And we've talked about this before, but I'll talk about it again. What do we do? We sold, we, we bought some calls. What should we never do? Never buy naked calls. I mean, they, these are leftovers from, from other trades or whatever, but the thing is, look at the naked calls deteriorating on us. So, um, well, no, key is even, but, but uh, GoPro. That cost us 750 bucks. That's a lot of money. It's <laughs> a whole month's input. Um, Spreads are much better. Here's New York Community Bank. We bought the stock. We sold the calls. We, we were a little bit ahead there, thirty dollars ahead there, even though the bank, even though it's had problems. Uh, Cheesecake Factory. We just put that in. It was a great call. We made good money already, two thousand bucks. In fact, I think we cashed this one out, right? Yeah, we cashed that, that. That did so well, we cashed it out already. You know, and again, when when you make too much money. Right, this is this this made two thousand six hundred dollars. It's only a twenty five hundred dollars spread. What's the point of keeping it? <laughs> it's, it made more money than the spread will be worth when it finishes. So that we quickly flip over because now we've got twenty five hundred more dollars to spend on something else that can make us some money. Ford just had a good announcement um, on vehicle deliveries or something like that. And uh, we were a tiny bit ahead on them, but that's going to be, that's on track. So that's not a problem. That's going to make its money. Levi, and look how conservative everything is, right? It's like, it's, it's you know, New York Community Bank, well, they, they had troubles, but realistically, they're a good bank. Cheesecake Factory, Ford, Levi's, Pfizer, 
uh, SoFi is, is probably a little bit riskier than the other ones, and it's actually barely barely on track, but I do like this one. It has a great return. Sun Power, that's definitely risky because they've been falling apart, but I think they'll catch back up. AT&T, uh, Tronx, great company. Uh, Valet is our trade of the year. Miner, they're going to get themselves back on track. They're actually performing poorly right now. Uh, Walgreen Boots Alliance, you know, obviously Walgreens and CVS are everywhere. Um, uh, Trivago is a little travel company, and yeah, so 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 far, but but I think there's a pretty safe trade. We're very conservative. We we bought them for 245. We plan to sell them for 250 in October, and if we do, we're going to make a nice bit of money, like 40 percent, 60 percent, something like that, in just a few months. And here's our hedge, yes, QQQ. We have a hedge also. And that's it. Very conservative trades, very, uh, you know, for the most part, blue chippy kind of companies, not taking a huge risk. You know, the, the SoFi sold off, so we jumped in and bought it, basically. Cheesecake Factory, we, we bet that they would have good earnings, and they did. Um, Pfizer's, Pfizer's is a stupid price. They're up now, they're more like 33 now. But that, this was an idiotic price for Pfizer, so we jumped on it. It's just value investing. That's all it is. We pick stocks that have very good values where we think the floor is definitely in, and then it should be straight up from there. That 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 it's just a question of people adjusting their attitudes on things. And and yeah, you'll notice that we tend to have shitty charts. We have shitty charts because those are the ones that are on sale. If it had a good chart, it wouldn't be on sale. We're not TA people at all. Not even not even the beginning of close to being TA people. Ooh, what is this? Is this the home button? I'm confused. Let's try this. Oh, because that's the image. And I just said to the premium members, let's um I'll give you an idea of what we're doing there. I'm just introducing the portfolio, and I've talked about Intel extensively, and we already have Intel in our in our other portfolios. It's not a surprise to anybody I like Intel. Intel's really cheap. They have a catalyst because they just rolled out their new chips and made announcements and said, here's how we're going to make our next $100 billion. And it looked good to me. It looked good to most analysts, but for some reason, still nobody's buying it. It's going to take <clears throat> it's going to take something like a uh, Boo Boo Kitty or whatever his name is going on Reddit and saying <laughs> I like Intel now. You know something's got to change people's attitudes on it. <clears throat> and I compared it to Nvidia. I mean, you know, Intel's trading at 20 times earnings. Nvidia's trading at 45 times promise. But in, in Nvidia, Intel's trading on on 20 times very realistic earnings, whereas Nvidia is trading on 45 times this is what we think we're going to make but the reality for nvidia is the competition is going to come they have no competition right now they're selling these chips they're the only ones who have the chips that everybody wants right now because everyone else didn't know anybody wanted them nvidia didn't know anybody wanted them what you know what happened is the ai companies came to them and said hey you know what would be perfect for us is your your uh, video adapt your video chips would be perfect for the AI we're trying to develop. So can you help us tweak it and make it that way? And Nvidia is like, sure, we got nothing else to do because <laughs> we're we're not at the time they were not a very exciting company here. They were not a very exciting company, and all of a sudden. They start producing these uh, these AI chips for the AI companies, and the AI companies have unlimited budgets. You know, they get ten billion dollars from Microsoft and things like that, and they like, yeah, we'll take every single chip you can you can make. And so Nvidia is just running a printing press. Oh, what does Nvidia do? They say, oh, oh those five thousand dollar chips, they're twenty five thousand now. And that's why NVIDIA is doing so well. They're selling $5,000 chips for $25,000 because there is no competition and there's more AI companies than they can supply. 
Look at what Elon Musk just got in trouble for today. He, he, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, he hijacked, I guess would be the word. He hijacked Tesla's supply of NVIDIA chips and put it into his AI company, which is not owned by Tesla. And he made up this bullshit thing. He's like, well, you know, well, we Tesla wasn't ready to use them, so there was no point. And so, you know, it would have just sat on the shelf over at Tesla. And meanwhile, we have we want to put it to use right away. That doesn't. <laughs> I mean, that's like, you know, that's like stealing the crown jewels and saying, well, the queen only wears it once a year, and I'm going to go out every weekend. So <laughs> you can't prosecute me for stealing the crown jewels because I was going to use them, man. Um, that's basically Elon Musk's excuse for taking million, I, I, I don't even know the number, many, many tens of millions of dollars worth of chips he took from Tesla. In addition to the fact that he's suing them now to give him $50 billion. Um, yeah, let me, I'll say something about that too. All right, here's the thing. You see a lot of people going on TV defending Elon Musk. Okay. They he already went to court and the judge already threw out his uh compensation agreement. And you know why it got thrown out? Because his compensation agreement was written by Elon Musk and his brother and a couple of his friends who are the board of directors of Tesla, without going past any of the shareholders of Tesla, the people who put up actual money into the company. Um, and the agreement says, if you can grow this company from not, let's say nothing, let's say it's a hundred million, $200 million company at a time. But if you can grow this company to a trillion dollar company, then you're going to get $50 billion. You're going to get 5% of, of what you've done at least, you know, in, as a compensation. That sounds almost fair, except market cap doesn't equal profits, especially in the case of Tesla, which trades at 100 times earnings. And that wasn't incorporated into the agreement. No, in no way does it say Tesla has to have a profit, but they do have to pay him $50 billion. And that's ridiculous because they don't have $50 billion. And there was it, it was a ridiculous agreement to make. It's not a normal compensation. It's not what anybody in the business gets. Nobody gets fifty billion dollars handed to them like that. You know. Also, he is a beneficial owner. You know, Bill Gates got rich. He didn't get rich paying himself a billion dollars a year in salary. Bill Gates got rich because he owned the Microsoft stock. And the same thing for Bezos and everyone else. A lot of these guys take it take a very minimal compensation. But, and you know why? Because it makes your stock more valuable. Elon, and this is why you don't want to invest in this company or anything he's involved in. He's a, he doesn't give a shit about the shareholders. And, and by the way, that should be really scary to you too. When a guy is a shareholder, a majority shareholder of a company, and he would rather take the money out of the company than grow the company, that's really scary. But here's the point. So Tesla's trading 60 times forward earnings, which is bullshit because they're not going to make that. Um, every year before this, they lost money. Tesla only makes $10, $12 billion a year. $50 billion is more money than the company has ever made. How can you pay somebody every cent the company ever made? But then what's the company do? Die? Borrow? Put put all the put all the investors in debt so that they can give him fifty billion dollars when he already owns like a third of the company? It's bullshit. And that's what the judge said. The judge says this was an ill-advised, ill-conceived compensation plan that is extremely detrimental to the shareholders of this company. And it only benefits one person, Elon Musk. And he's already a shareholder. He gets a benefit from the stock going up.
you know, whenever you see a company that's that's giving ridiculous amounts of money away to the, uh, you know, to the CEOs and things like that, you should always be worried about that. You got to look at the realistic numbers and say, where are they going to get fifty billion dollars? And they're already, uh, oh, they're not in debt. They have twenty-one billion in cash. All right, take that back. So they they have a good cash stockpile, but he wants to take it and put it. So he, he wants to take this money, all the money they've ever earned. He wants to take it and put them $27 billion in debt so he can be compensated. And he hasn't even offered a settlement. He hasn't even said, you know what, I'll take 20 billion and be happy. Instead, what he said, it, and, 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 and what he said and done, instead he's saying, oh, well then you know what, screw you, I'm taking my AI company, which I built with Tesla engineers on Tesla facilities, and now I'm stealing Tesla chips, and I'm going to take that company and to make it totally separate so that no Tesla shareholder benefits from that. That's all mine. He already took SpaceX and did the same thing. He took Hyperloop and was doing the same thing, except Hyperloop is garbage and doesn't work. So there, there's nothing to fight over there. But he still wasted Tesla's time and resources on that. And that's the other thing, by the way. He's got so many different, and Twitter, he's got Twitter. He's got so many different freaking things going on. How is he doing his job even as the CEO of Tesla? I, I don't care who you are. I'm a really good multitasker, but I got to limit myself to five companies. I, I, can't, I can't run 10 companies. Um, you know, he, it's not only that, I certainly can't run 10 companies and be on Twitter 24 hours a day spouting off my opinion and going on podcasts and such he's it's crazy i it really is i mean this whole thing it's a travesty to to pay him the money that he's asking for and it, it does, and you know what i understand that he wants to get it he's wrong he's greedy he's a, he's a prick that's beside the point what gets me is the people who defend him what what is wrong with that they're on TV saying, oh, well, he that was a deal they made, so they have to stick to it. It's like, no, that was a deal that he made with himself and his buddies on the board that had nothing to do with the benefit to the benefit of the company. They all shirked their fiduciary duty to the company making this compensation package, and it only came to light now as he's triggering all these things. I mean, also at the time, the target seemed kind of absurd. It's like, well, he's not going to make a tr you know, we're not going to have a trillion dollar market cap. That'd be crazy. And you do imagine that if you get to a trillion dollar market cap, you must be making a hundred billion a year or fifty billion a year. That's not the case. It's a highly overvalued market cap based on the hate machine that Elon Musk constantly plays. And not only that, though, but Tesla investors think they're getting SpaceX and Hyperloop and uh, Twitter and all that. They, these are all separate ventures of his. He does not do these things for the benefit of the company, but it does suck up a massive amount of his time. And meanwhile, Tesla, of course, is floundering because Tesla was worth twice. Tw Tesla was worth a trillion dollars, and now it's worth uh, five hundred billion dollars. So it's not even worth his trigger point anymore. That's 10 years. You know, this is when they made the deal. <laughs> and now it's way up here. But yeah, share price does not, you know, market cap and share price does not equal profit. The bottom line is, and this is where it's completely ridiculous, it's more money than the company has ever made total. And that's not even subtracting the losses that they had going, going getting towards that. And that's another thing. What's his incentives? His incentives are misbalanced for the company. Because his attitude was, I don't give a shit how much money I lose. I need to hype this thing up and push it and, and, and pretend we have self-driving when we don't and so on and so forth. And and risk people's safety and so on and so forth with with putting out unready product, and I need to do that to get us to this valuation, so it'll trigger my compensation plan. And after I get my fifty billion dollars, I don't give a shit. <laughs> you 
he could have just built a good company, could have just, you know, done everything right and built it correctly and focused on, on the thing that mattered. But Tesla didn't matter to him because he triggered his compensation and now he's looking for the next thing because he knows that Tesla is in the end going to be a car company. And that's not a good thing because car companies don't make that kind of money. All their money that they make comes from incentives. You know, they come from, they come from government rebates and things like that that are, that are incentivizing the production of solar vehicles. EV tax credits, things like that. That's where his profits come from. They don't come from profits selling the cars because no automaker makes money selling cars. Selling cars is a very, very thin margin business and he sells cars. In the end, that's the fact. And, and, and as other people, and he's getting killed in China because as other companies also start making electric vehicles, people are going to say, well, you know what? I'm buying an electric vehicle. I could buy a Tesla. I could buy a Hyundai. I could buy this. I could buy that. They're not necessarily choosing Tesla. And he has to then drop his price, decrease his profits, so on and so forth. It's a rough business. Many, many, many car companies enjoyed a brief period of popularity. He knew this. This is why he structured his compensation package that way. Many car companies enjoy a period of popularity and then fizzle out. Because they're new, they're intriguing, blah, blah. You think of like a DeLorean or something like that. Uh, an Edsel. <laughs> um, um, the Saab for a while was hugely pop was popular in America for whatever reason. You know. They're still around, I guess, but they're kind of dead. Um, you know, companies come and go, and you think they're going to stay, but then they don't because it's a tough, tough business. And it requires very focused management, and it's all about costing and, and uh, you know, in, in innovation and costing. That's what it's all about in the auto business. And we are not getting that from Tesla. He is He's not even paying attention. So... You know, a normal auto company is it, lucky to get a 15 times valuation. They're getting a 60 times valuation on projections that probably aren't going to hit. And that essentially means that 175, they'll be lucky to hold 100, I think. They still got quite a while to fall. All right, so that's what we're doing there. Uh, what are we talking about? So I talked about the trades we added, right? Oh, oh I'm sorry, we we're on this portfolio, yeah. So then we're talking about Intel. I don't know how we got to Tesla. And we had a lot of information about Intel. And I said, look, it's, it's going to be a good trade. So so for a bigger trade, for you know, because these are for the premium members, they're generally high net worth. So I said, you know, here's a way to play. We can play... Uh, Intel with 50 uh, 20s and 40 35s short and $35 puts, which is aggressive because Intel's not 35 at the moment. Uh, and that's the play. And that's $29,250 on the $75,000 spread. It's $50,000 in the money, though, to start. That's what I like about it. And it still has 156% upside. Even though you're starting off, you're spending $29,000 to be $50,000 in the money. And again, we're not swinging for the fences. We're very happy to make 150% in 16 months. That's like 10% a month. That's pretty good money. Now, in the swing trading portfolio, and this is what we're still trying to fill, uh, the October 25 calls, selling the $30 calls, and selling the $30 puts. And again, a little bit aggressive on that. And that's $1,800 on the $5,000 spread. Um, and that has $3,200 of upside, which I didn't do the math, but it's whatever. It's 150% of upside potential on that trade. And then we looked at the oil. Oh, how's the oil doing? Oil had a big build. Charts, charts, charts. Ew, these are not my charts. What is wrong? Uh-oh. Shit. I thought I just did this. 
commodity trade charts. No? Setup. What did I do wrong? That? No? I literally just loaded up the setup and it doesn't seem like it's working. Save workspace, share workspace, delete workspace, webinar. There we go. What the hell? I wasn't doing that before. Oh no, it still doesn't have the charts. That's why. Well, I'm certainly not going to set those up now. I'm pissed off. Um, so let's go back to the futures and look at the indexes. That's upsetting. All right, so here's where we are now. Still chugging along the freaking NASDAQ, right? And the Russell is still moving up nicely. Very good. Oh, we're going to talk about oil. For some reason, oil is going up. Oil had a horrendous draw. Let's take a look at the EIA. Petroleum status report. <laughs> there we go. So as of May 31st, which is very recently, uh, da, 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 da. Well, we can see it right here, so I'm going to have to read it. So oil went from 4.7 to 5.5, so that's up 1.2. Gasoline went from 8.8 .8 to 30.9, that's 2.1. Uh, distillate went from 9.3 to 22.5, that's 3.2. These are all pluses. Look at all other oils. This is her. Well, this is horrifying. All other oils, the stuff they don't count and you don't see in the headlines went from 60.4 to 67.3, 7 million barrel build in the stuff that you don't look at. The Even the Strategic Petroleum Reserve <laughs> added barrels, which should have come out of inventory somewhere. So on the whole, you went from 32.5 to 46.8. That is uh, 14 million barrels. That is almost an entire day of production of the U.S. of the U.S. went to inventory. And that's consistent with what we've been seeing year after year, you know, year after year at this point. I mean, every single week, it's very consistent that the reality is that we do not use one full day's worth of production in this country. That we're we're and and but we're not usually we're not using it and we're exporting it. That's what we do. We send out four million barrels a day of petroleum product. And if we weren't doing that, these numbers would be ridiculous. We'd be swimming in oil. We send out 28, whatever the number is, 30. That's another insane number, actually, when you think about it. So it's 4.3 times 7, 30. We send 30 million barrels of oil, of petroleum product, refined product. That's the point. We take in the oil and we refine it for overseas. So this number gets turned around. We take it, we take 2.4 million barrels in, which we don't need because we're just, you know, it just gets dumped into the SPR. But we take 2.4 million barrels in, we refine it, and we send it right back out. We don't ever, you know, we, it doesn't really touch the U.S. inventory. We're only taking oil from other countries and turning it around, refining it, and sending it out as product. You know, it's, it's a nice business for refiners. That's what they're there to do. You build a refinery, what do you want to do? Refine oil. So if they don't have enough oil to refine in the U.S., they start refining other oil that they can find. Um, but that's 30 million barrels. So when you think about it, we're sending 30 million barrels out of the country and we're building up 16 million more barrels. That's 46 million barrels. 
that is two and a half days <laughs> worth of production. So what's that? What's 2.5 divided by seven? Let's see. 2.5 divided by seven, 35%. One third, one third of the U.S. production is not necessary for the U.S. And that's the thing. So whenever, when people tell you how much oil the U.S. uses, it's not true. We don't use 20 million barrels of oil a day. We use 14 million barrels of oil a day, and the rest we send overseas or it goes to build our reserves. Yet all the pricing and everything else is built on this fake statistic that it makes it seem like we're using more than we are because we're selling it overseas. That's not using oil. That's not demand for the U.S. And, and what this does, this number steadily increasing, right? That goes up all the time. It was four last year. Now it's 4.3. Used to be this number used to be 1.5. Now it's four. Now it's 4.5 almost. I mean, it's, it's you know. So all that extra oil that we send out of the country makes it look like our demand isn't dropping and dropping and dropping, but the reality is it is. And also, when you read all this crap about Americans not going for EVs and not doing this and not doing that. Bullshit. It's bullshit. We have a minimum 35 mile per gallon fleet average required by the government for every single automaker with no exceptions. They have to sell a fleet of cars that averages 35 miles a gallon. So therefore, whether it's electric or whether it's a hybrid or whatever it is, they've got to have better mileage and more efficient cars going out the door than they had before. Therefore, since the old cars average 20 miles a gallon and the new cars average 35 miles per gallon, most people are trading in 20 mile a gallon cars for 35 mile a gallon cars. That means if a person drives 15,000 miles a year divided by 35 miles per gallon, they're using 428. When they were driving 15,000, they're not driving more miles divided by uh, 20 miles a gallon, they were using 750. 750 minus 428 is saving 322 gallons a year divided by 750, 42%. <coughs> so 43%. So we are using 43% less fuel for every single new car. This is our average. 42% more less fuel is being used by the cars. Now, we have a not growing population. We already have 200 million cars for 300 million people in this country. So I don't think we actually need more cars. And so you have a static amount of cars, a static amount of total driving that people are doing, the, the amount of driving people are doing, not increasing, the decreasing, frankly. Um, and the variable is then how many gallon miles per gallon of the car is getting. As the fleet turns over, we use less and less and less and less fuel because we don't need it. That also goes for the truckers who are cutting, who are increasing their fuel efficiency, and they are required by the government to do so. Uh, that goes for the airlines who are that's their main cost is fuel. One third of their total expenses is fuel. Um, so so not one third of their expenses even, it's about one third of their revenue. So it's more than a third of their expenses. Um, so it's a concerted all round effort driving down our, our usage of fuel quarter by quarter by quarter, it's more and more. Every time a new car is sold, to somebody who had a car that gets that gets lower mileage, right? Which is the case for most people. There aren't so far there aren't a lot of people turning in the 30 mile and 40 mile and a gallon cars because they've only been making them for it since five years. So these older cars that get turned in as they come off the road, we use less and less and less fuel. And it's not just us, we are the slowest company country. It's bullshit, it's propaganda bullshit when they tell you that we're not adapting to EVs. That's nonsense. It's the auto industry, it's the oil industry, it's not even the auto industry, it's really the oil industry 
who are trying to stop it and are trying to, to tell you EVs are bad, there's this problem, that problem. Remember they're telling you they all blew up and there would be battery fires everywhere and so on and so forth? Where? Millions and millions of EVs are on the road now. Where are the fires? Of course, yes, they do catch fire once in a while, but so do internal, so do regular cars. Regular cars catch fire. You've seen regular cars on fire all the time. They got gasoline and gasoline's super flammable. They have great safety things. So do the electric cars have great safety things. Can they break? Can the batteries break? Can they catch fire? Sure. But you know what? We've even had like massive flooding where these things have been underwater and they're certainly not supposed to be swimming in the, in the, in the, in the water um, and still not really a problem. Completely overblown bullshit that is meant to keep America on fuel as long as possible because there's billions of dollars being made by the people selling us fuel. But you gotta use your head and think about it. I, but And again, we are the slowest out of all the countries in the world. We are the worst at, the, at, at moving forward with the adoption of EVs and getting off internal combustion engines, but we have to do it. Freaking Mexico just elected an, an environmental uh, activist to be president of the country. She is a she's a PhD environmental scientist who's extremely uh, extremely big on on affecting change for global warming to stop global warming. So and and that's a major oil producing country. She wants to stop fossil fuel in 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 a country whose main export is fossil fuel. Um, the whole world is like that. Our main export is fossil fuel now too. We are the top oil. We produce more oil in Saudi Arabia. And by the way, that's what happened at OPEC this, this weekend that just went by. They they can't cut any more production because every time they cut production, we take their market share. We keep adding production. They keep cutting production. They're losing their market share to America. We're just supplying the oil wherever they don't. We're like, fine, you want to cut back? You know, again, it's like it's like if NVIDIA said, oh, we're not, oh, you know what? We're going we're gonna to produce less chips. That'll show you. And Intel's like, yeah, that'll show you. <laughs> you guys go right ahead and produce less chips, you know, because because eventually NVIDIA is going to do this too, because they're going to want to keep the price of the chips up. So they're going to say, well, we're not going to produce as many, and that'll keep the, the demand up. And Intel's going to say, no, 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 that's not how chips work. <laughs> we're going to run out. We're going to run hours 27 hours a day somehow. We'll, we'll we'll figure out a way to, to double to double run our production line to make up for it. All crazy, but th this is and this is just insane. I mean, it just really, really, absolutely maddening. Notice the pricing on the retail side. We're back to where we were last year. Now there's no real increase in prices. Um. Even though oil, see the retail, this is where you know demand is low, right? Because oil itself was 71, 72, now it's 78.50, right? Well, I don't, don't know what it is this week, but it was 78.50 last week. So oil went from 71 to 78, which is 10% higher, but the, the products are lower. And you know what that means? Aha, ha, ha. you want to make a trade out of that? Go with the refineries. What does that mean? They're buying oil for 10% more money, but they're selling the gasoline for the same price. That means they're going to make less money than they made last year. So now we have a trade. We go to Valero. See, if you talk about something enough, you can figure out where the trade is. Then we go to Valero, the biggest refiner, and we see how they're trading. <clears throat> and they're trading well above where they were trading last year. But they're making less money than they were making last year. The demand is down. The price of oil, their input costs are up and their output costs are down. The output revenues are down. <laughs> um, that's not good. So Valero is a good short. And who else is a pure refiner? Uh, Sunoco, I think, is kind of is a more or less uh, pure refiner. You want to catch who's it? Whoever hasn't come down yet. Uh, 
No, it's, well, Sunoco still way above last year. They were 40 and now they're 51. But I think Valero had a better story for us. Valero is 150 and they were 100. So they're 50% over. Uh, Sunoco is only 20% over where they were last year. These guys are 50% over. So that makes a good short. It would have been even better if we'd found caught it a little bit sooner. But that's the wrong price for Valero right there. There And there's a discrepancy. And that's exactly the kind of thing we want to take advantage of. Then we go and look for a good play on Valero. The market's just so crazy. It's hard to short stuff. But if we went to Valero and we look at when they oh when you gotta you know you gotta put everything together. So when does when does Valero report? Where is Yahoo? There you go. VLO. <laughs> All right. So Valero. Do, 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 do. Earnings, earnings, earnings. Okay, so late July. They're going to report in late July. They're paying a dividend. Uh, they just paid out their dividend. Everybody seems to be happy about that. Uh, the market cap for Valero is $50 billion. But that's not the, that's not the thing I like to look at something like that on. BLO. <coughs> So what is expect? Wow, wow. They're expecting to make less money this year anyway. They made eight billion dollars, eight point eight billion dollars last year. They're only gonna make five point four this year and four point four next year. This is a great short. All right, the PE is very low though. It's only nine point eight, but they're not gonna make that kind of money. What you gotta look at is they're fifty point eight divided by five point four, maybe ten. Maybe ten if they hit these numbers, but I don't think that they counted on the uh, price of uh, on the on the crack spread changing so drastically, and so that's worth looking at. And then the next thing I'd want to look at, I would ver first got to verify all that stuff, which is boring research. We're not going to do that right now. But first we have to verify that stuff. Then we have to pick a time frame. They earn in late July. We want to give it a little buffer, so maybe September we do some shorting. And in this case, we'd be buying calls or we'd either be selling the short calls or buying puts. What looks better? Can sell, wow, 10 bucks there. One six, I feel better about selling the 160s. So the 160s are all premium and you can sell them for eight bucks, the short calls. And if we do that, It's too aggressive for um, a hundred thousand dollar portfolio. The, see, the buying power effect is negative twenty five. This is regular margin, not portfolio margin. Um, so the buying power effect is twenty five thousand, and all you're going to make is well, you're going to make eight thousand. It's not bad. I mean, you, you can make up to eight thousand dollars if it goes well, but it's a lot of buying power. Plus, if it goes up, you get really screwed on the margin. So the other way to do it would be to pursue the short puts and maybe a spread. So then you got to figure out like where's what's what's worth having. And let's say, well, let's say we did the 175, 155. That's no good. I don't like that because it's a uh, 970 and 2250. So let's say it's 2250 and 950. No, it wouldn't be. It'd be 23. Sorry. So 23 and 970 is that's no good. That's um uh, about 14 bucks. So 14 bucks for a $20 spread, you only make 50%. That doesn't make any sense. So I think better off taking something like this, the September 130s, just as a straight put for if you can get them for two bucks or 205 is fine. If you can get these for 205 and you imagine that Valero drops 
then the 130s should be what the 140s are, which is $4, and that's 100% higher. So bingo, that's the way to play because they're going to keep their value. And you know how you can tell how much value they're probably going to keep? Let's go September, August is one month away. So let's say 60 days from now, I forgot what they were. Um, 130 puts. How much are the July 130 puts? They're 45 cents. So now we know what the theta decay is, okay? So in other words, if the if Valero stays at this price, which is 154, if Valero stays at 154 for two months, then our 134, then our 130 puts are going to lose 75 cents. So it's going to cost us. Um, if we wait until earnings, it's going to cost us a dollar fifty to wait in theta decay. That's what we have to be aware of, that the time decay is going to cost us most of our money. Um, so it's not a great play as a naked put because basically in 20, in not in 20 days, in 60 days, we're going to lose $1.50. So we're going to lose um, three cents a day, let's say, on, the, on, this, on this position. And then the question is, is there a catalyst in the short term? That's the point you want to think about it as, is there a catalyst in the in the reasonable time frame that's gonna that's gonna show me this? And, not, and apparently not really. Nobody seems to uh, nobody seems to really pay attention to these numbers, and they do fluctuate a lot. But right now, you can see that the crack spread is very much against Valero. So I don't see a really good. The bottom line is I don't see a really good low commitment sort of way to play it. You'd have to make a real commitment to shorting them. And if that were the case, then I would be going out to maybe, um, well, it's either September or December. So I can say we'd go with September. And I'd probably say they're certainly going to be lower than 155. So I looked at, I, you know, again, it goes back to selling these, but then buying what to cover. And those are not particularly attractive um, sales. What if we sell the July? What if we sell the 150 puts for 375? And what can we buy? Yeah, I don't like that. No, nah, they don't have very good options to play, unfortunately. It's a little tricky. I have to give that some more thought. There's not a very good options way to play them. And I think that's probably just because it's so many, the, the, the general consensus is probably that they're going down and all those that's driven the option pricing to be not very attractive. And again, you make 50% in um, 107 days. And basically in three months, you make 50%. If it goes correctly, that's not terrible, but it's not so exciting that I feel compelled to put the bet down. <laughs> and by the way, that's a good glimpse behind the scenes of what I do all day. Like I, I look at dozens and dozens and dozens of things. I do all the research. This is a problem. I do all the research and I look up all the stuff and I find out all the things. And I decide I want to make the trade. And then when I look at the options, I'm like, ah, oh, I can't put anything together that really, you know, that's really exciting. And if I can't do that, then I have to throw the whole thing out and start again and go to the next thing. But that is the way the cookie crumbles, folks. Any questions? No questions. Fantastic. I must be doing great. All right. Uh, what else do we want to talk about? Oh, I guess the overall economic nonsense is worth discussing. <clears throat> so next week we have uh, the Fed, the, the, the Fed meeting. Oh, oh, no, no, not next week. So yeah, next week we have the Fed meeting. The week after that, I think Wednesday we're closed. The markets are closed on Juneteenth, which is uh, the Wednesday of, I guess, the 12th, the 19th. must be the 19th of June. So we have that extra national holiday now. Uh, this was interesting. I thought the Americans have more investment income than ever because, obviously, the markets are up 20%. People are making money in the market. 
this is the NBA got $76 billion in a TV deal. You wonder why these freaking players make so much money. There's only like 10 players on a team. <laughs> Let's figure that out. Um, how many players on an NBA roster. There you go. Da, 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 da. Limited, 15, they're limited to 15 players during the regular season. So it so says 15 regular season players. How many players on an NBA roster? And then how many NBA teams? 30 teams. Okay, so you got 30 teams. 30 teams, top, well, times 15, is 450 players. So there's 450 players, and they've got $76 billion to play with. Uh, that's just the TV. That's not even counting the stadium sales and stuff like that. <clears throat> Da, 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 da. Average regular season viewership. Look at that. And, and it's nothing compared to NFL. Wow. I didn't realize basketball was that far behind football. Who came up with this number? NBC, $2.5 billion a year. Only to show 100 games. Amazon's 1.8 billion a year. Disney, 2.6 billion a year. Holy cow. I, it's hard to figure out the number, but 2.5, 4.5, another 2.5, 6.5, billion dollars a year. Oh, there you go. An average of $7 billion. So $7 billion divided by 400 players. Seven billion dollars more zeros. Is that enough zeros? <laughs> Divided by 450 players. Fifteen million dollars per player is how much they have to play with. And some baseball, I somebody signed a baseball contract for some insane amount of money. Uh, I, <laughs> I forgot what it was. I was just looking at this number. I was like, are you joking? <laughs> He got like a $140 million contract for playing baseball. I was like, what is going on in this world? But that's, I, I don't know. <laughs> that's crazy. I, I can't believe basketball has that much less than football. NFL, man, they, 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 they really got this. They really screwed us. <laughs> Wow. Considering I mean, considering the health risk of football, it's a bit it's a whole different thing. Um we're mad at Iran, Hezbollah, you know, honestly, it's no big deal. Nothing blatant going on in the news over there. We'll see what Mr. Bloomberg has to say. Big tech drive stocks. Yeah, I pointed that out earlier today. I said, I said this, you know, this rally. Well, that was in the other post. See, that's annoying. Now I have to switch posts, so I have to add another tab. La da da. Here. So this was earlier. Things that these guys are starting to catch up. But look at look at the domination of these. This is a magnificent seven area, basically. And look how red everything else was early this morning. It was real. I mean, it was a bad, bad looking market. Except for all of a sudden, you get to big tech, and everything's beautiful. And that's not healthy. That's this is no way. This is no way to run a rally. It really isn't. I don't know how long we can keep going like this. This is some crazy stuff going on. 
anyway, so let's see if there's any exciting setups that seem to make sense to play before we go. I, I want to do some day trading stuff and show you guys, but I, I, I'm not going to do it unless there's a good setup. We talked about shorting oil. I remember it's 77.50 or 78.50, but we were looking at short oil if it crossed under. It's very tempting here, but no, nah, that's not a, it's not a high percentage play. That's a problem. Bonds bounced up a lot. I don't think in the grand scheme of things so much. Yeah. But they they recovered nicely off of, off of this mess in the last couple of days. We got some weak, you know, we got some weak data. This is weekly. So coffee is still blasting up. Cocoa still pretty high. Cotton collapsed. Lumber collapsed. Sugar collapsed. Interesting, right? Orange is still because you know, here you got crop damage, crop damage, crop damage from the heat. We're <laughs> By, by the way, talk about macros, man. We are in trouble. Oh, still record-breaking temperatures. Right now, the West is getting hit with the massive heat. The oceans are warming up faster than they ever had before early in the season. Uh, it's forcing migration changes in the fish. It's killing fish. It's killing uh, the, the barrier reefs and things like that. We can't fix this stuff. You know, you you, know, you can't just work your way out of these things. Gold 23.74 is getting back towards 24. Gold's just consolidating for a, a move much higher. Um, Silver is going to pretty much follow gold, so it's probably going to keep holding 30 and be bouncing around there. Copper, you know, not, you know, nice retrace. It's going to consolidate and probably move up also. Because, uh, you know, what do you need copper for? You need copper for electric vehicles and all sorts of... Uh, any any sort of electrical products, we need copper. So there's a lot of copper being used. It was never used before. And meats is no big deal. So look at soybean crash, corn crash. Wow. I mean, all this stuff was really high. It was worryingly high not too long ago, and now they're all down. And how's the dollar doing? Dollar's pretty flat. Just zoom, you know. It's sort of moving between 104 and 106, and it's tricky. Look at the yen back to 60. The yen is dying. That's not good. They, they, this is with intervention. That's this is a collapsing currency, guys. They don't know what to do with themselves. And why is that? Well, because their currency play, pays 0% interest and our currency pays 4.5% interest. That's why. That's a pretty big difference. And the reality for the planet is there's inflation. If you if you put your money into Japan, you are basically just, just handing, you're taking a loss. You just create, you're just doing a charitable thing. There's no profit in putting your money into a Japanese bank and getting Japanese returns. And we're next. We're the next biggest debtor. They're the biggest debtor. We're second biggest. It's going to be a problem down the road. Uh, anyway, so... Nothing particularly exciting for trading setup. We'll look forward again next week. The worst thing you can do is trade just because, you know, when, you, when you're trading, you have to be able to sit down and look at the screens and say, nope, nothing here, and walk away. I know that's hard because most people, you set a time, you say, oh, I'm going to do some trading at lunch, or I'm going to do some trading at this time on this day. And then you sit there, and you're there to do it. You're not there to not trade, you're there to trade. But then you try to pick the least bad thing that you can see to trade. And that's terrible. You should only trade when you see something very obvious that has a high probability of success. Because even if you think, just like when you swing at a baseball, right? They tell you don't swing unless you, unless you got it. Even when you swing at a baseball, 
even if you wait patiently for your pitch, even if you do everything right, you're still going to miss more than half the time you swing the bat. You're still going to miss the freaking ball. You're going to hit a foul ball or something like that. You're not going to get a good connection most of the time. And that's true of trading too. Even if you prepare, even if you're ready, even if you think you've got everything on your side, you are still not going to get a hit every time. And that's where money management discipline comes in. The money management, in other words, making sure your losses are small and, you're, and, and, and you can't make sure that your wins are big, but if you make sure your losses are small and you have a reasonable percentage of wins, you will do well. And, and I mean a good, a good ratio. So what I want to see is I want to be, let's say, about 80% sure that I'm right. And so that's going to be my swing. I'm going to make 80% sure I'm right. And even if I even if I think I'm going to be right 80% of the time, I'm still going to be wrong maybe half the time. But half the time is fine as long as I'm going to make twice as much money when I'm right as I lose when I'm wrong. Because that means I only have to be right one out of three times to break even. So anything over one out of three, right? So in other words, if I, if I manage my losses, so that I'm not going to lose more than a dollar, but when I win, I'm going to win two dollars. My risk reward, right? My rewards are double my risk, at least double my risk. And as long as I do that, that means I'm going to make two dollars and I'm going to lose a dollar. So three swings, minus one, plus one, plus one. That's very profitable. The two ones cancel out, the win and the loss cancel out, and the second one is a winner. So if I if I if I lose twice though and I win once I'll be even. If two, so if I have two losses and one win and my one win is two dollars and my two losses are two dollars then I'm going to be even, and that's thirty three percent. Anything better than thirty three percent I'm going to make some serious money. And and our top trades are a good example. If you go to the top trade reviews on our site, um, we average seventy something percent in our top trade alerts. So and oh and I really I should have made the top I should have made the the, the Hewlett Packard trade should have been a top trade alert and so should the Cheesecake Factory. I didn't make them top trade alerts this month. Bad me. I got to make something up for the top trade people. Um. So that and so if you if you have good risk management and decent trading, you're gonna win. And that's really all we're doing. The fundamentals by starting with a strong fundamental basis. That that's giving us a high percentage that the trade's going to go in our direction, and after that, it's just a question of making the right kind of bet where the reward is much better than the risk on the trade. And that's what it's all about. And and like I said, you know, we you can see we can easily make eighty percent, a hundred percent, you know, plus on these trades, and then all we have to do is have a decent amount of winners, and they they wash over all the losses very quickly. All right, so that's enough of that. We will do this again next week. I will try very, very hard to find some good day trading stuff. Oh, wait. Somebody had a question. Curious if you talk about the DHI trade I proposed in member chat. Jason, I did not see that. And um, I will certainly talk about it in member chat. All right. Um, Randy says, this is nuts. I wonder what's nuts. <laughs> anyway. Um, all right, so everything's cool. All right, good. We will do this again next week. I'm going to try, hopefully, we'll, we'll look every week. We're going to try and find some day trades. That's going to be our first thing now because we have this new portfolio and I can do it live for you. Um, so we'll work on that. And but I, like I said, the, there's no guarantee that it, at Wednesday at one o'clock we're going to have great opportunities to do day trading, but we'll do our best and we'll try to teach more of those kind of techniques to people. Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. Have a great time. See you next week.